Hey y'all, Ryan Sprague here. As you all know, the Somewhere in the Skies podcast is always free to consume, but it isn't free to create. That's why I've started the Somewhere in the Skies Patreon campaign. On a monthly basis, you give what you think the show is worth. You'll be helping the show continue, grow, and to be something truly communal. And remember, there are rewards for each level of contribution, and the list is only growing. So please, help Somewhere in the Skies now by becoming a patron. To contribute and to learn more, visit www.patreon.com backslash somewhere skies. Thank you for your support. And now, on with the show. This is Somewhere in the Skies with Ryan Sprague. Welcome to Somewhere in the Skies. I'm your host, Ryan Sprague. So, we had some technical difficulties this week, and our interview completely vanished. I tried everything I could to resolve the issue, but sometimes you just had to accept the fate of the digital gods. So, in place of this week's interview, I'm bringing you a very fun conversation I had with the guys over at the Rewatchability Podcast. Rewatchability is a comedic pop culture podcast focusing on the movies and TV shows of the recent past. Each week, hosts J.M. McNabb, Blaine Waters, and Robert Laurent profile a cherished property from their youths to see if it holds up to the scrutinous eye of today. And I was honored to join them for the review of M. Night Shyamalan's alien-themed 2002 film, Signs. So kick back this week, rewatch Signs, and then come back and listen to our review. And let me know what you think on Twitter or Facebook. Do you think Signs is rewatchable? And be sure to check out all the reviews from Rewatchability right now by subscribing on all podcast apps or listen through their website, rewatchability.com. Keep looking up, and I hope you enjoy. Welcome to Rewatchability, the podcast where we rewatch old movies and TV shows to see if they hold up over time. My name is Blaine Waters. With me, as always, is Robert Larone and Jay McNabb. And this week on the podcast, we have a special guest, Ryan Sprague. What's up, guys? I'm so honored to be here. I've been listening to you for a while now. So uh, to actually have the tables turned and be the guest on a podcast, nonetheless yours, uh, I, I'm a little nervous, I must admit. But uh, we'll, we'll get through this and we'll get through signs as well. <laughs> the tables are turned. Yeah. <laughs> Sounds very dramatic. Yeah, we're like a Bond villain. This is great. <laughs> I, I like to start with a bang, for sure. Yeah, exactly. And we like to start by thanking our sponsor, HelloFresh. You can go to HelloFresh.ca and type in Rewatch50 for 50% off your first order. It's fresh food that comes to your door, and you can cook yourself. It's pretty great. And thank you to our Patreon sponsors for giving one, three, five dollars a month to keep yeah. the lights on here. We really appreciate it. And in return, we get the podcast early to you guys and, and other little perks, like uh, maybe coming up some back catalog stuff. Yeah, not not our show. Like, we'll send you old catalogs. <laughs> yeah, yeah serious catalogs. Got a bunch of them from <laughs> Rob's been using them as furniture and toilet paper. So. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> I got them from Mike Meyer's brother. <laughs> <laughs> and this week on the podcast, like Ryan said, we're going to be talking about M. Night Shyamalan's Shyamalan. Shyamalan? Shyamalan. Shyamalan. Yeah, we've done like three of his movies. You can't pronounce his name yet. Uh, He's your favorite director. He's your favorite person. I just call him M. Uh, (laughs) Because you feel like James Bond. The divine Miss M. We're doing his third movie in his oeuvre. Well, well, it's kind of his third movie. It's like his fourth or so, if you count other like that. The romantic comedies. Yeah, exactly. Well, yeah, didn't he write a Rosie O'Donnell movie or something? First Kid? Yeah. Yeah, this is uh, his first... uh, or his third directorial movie, right? Exactly, yeah. yeah. And, like, part of what's considered his oeuvre. So it's Signs with Mel Gibson and Joaquin Phoenix and Aliens. And some kids. <laughs> yeah. Oh, and some kids. Not yeah. just any kid. You got Little Miss Sunshine and a Culkin. <laughs> <laughs> a Culkin. And we should mention the tie-in why we're doing this mm-hmm. and why we're doing this with Ryan is because Ryan hosts a podcast on our network, the Antica Network, called Somewhere in the Skies. 
Mm-hmm. Do you want to give us just like a quick summary of what your podcast is about, Ryan? Yeah, absolutely, man. So I have been, you know, interested in the UFO phenomenon ever since I was a kid. Uh, I did have what I perceived to be a UFO sighting when I was 12 years old, uh, actually up near you guys. This is off of Lake Ontario. What, really? Whoa, and, like uh, on the U.S. half? Or, yeah. Uh, or on, the uh, on the U.S. half. Okay. Yep. I, I used to camp right on the border and I was fishing one night. I look up and I see these three white lights in a triangular formation, that red light in the middle, uh, just floating over the water, completely silent. It was terrifying. I didn't know what the hell I was looking at. I called for my dad to come out see what it is and he's watching a Yankees game inside so I couldn't really pull him away from that but he did eventually come <laughs> out he did see the tail end of this thing as it floated towards you guys and I was with us. after that <laughs> yeah right towards your house <laughs> <laughs> and uh, yeah yeah I, that fear kind of turned to an obsession I started looking wow. into the phenomenon ever since and that led to you know interviewing people about having seen UFOs in my hometown of uh, Sarah Syracuse, New York, and sort of branching out from there. AOL was big at the time, chat rooms and message boards. So I started going on there. And the rest is sort of history. I, I I heard about more and more sightings that people were having. I started writing for magazines. And that led to a book and then eventually the podcast, which is where the, uh, you know, the book ended and the journey continued in just, you know, hashing it out with people, having a debate about what these UFOs could be. You know, are they alien? Are they top secret military technology? Are they demonic? I mean, the and the, the <laughs> possibilities are endless about what these things could be. Whatever they are, they're unidentified. Mm-hmm. We don't know what they are. But uh, that's that's wow. kind of what the podcast is about. I bring people on in every walk of life, whether they're, you know, an academic, a scientist, uh, a musician, you know, your local barista, your coffee shop. Whatever. I just want to hear what everyone thinks about this topic and what profound implications it could have if we did discover that, you know, maybe this was alien. Who knows? So, yeah, that's what Somewhere in the Skies is all about. That's that's you, I, I that thought, sounds intense. <laughs> it's really intense. Have you interviewed any lapsed priests who uh, <laughs> who flipped back again after a UFO encounter? <laughs> oh, I've interviewed someone who actually became a priest after. Oh, really? So that was pretty interesting. Yeah, this guy he claims that he was abducted by aliens. All right, um, and he, during his abduction experience, he says that he saw a symbol by whatever these creatures were that abducted him. And it was, you know, it was a fist or excuse me, it was not a fist. It was two hands clasped together, like praying and a lightning through it. So he perceived this as, oh, I got to start praying. I got to become a priest. <laughs> oh, man. It's, it's like the, alien if, emojis. <laughs> if the symbol for Christianity was like a fist and a lightning bolt, I might be at church right now. Yeah. <laughs> that sounds awesome. That guy hanging off a cross. <laughs> Uh, you know, Although Mel Gibson loves that. Yeah, he sure does. <laughs> yeah, we should probably get into the yeah. movie. Well, that sounds great. I, I think you're going to bring a level of expertise to this stupid movie that we're going to talk about. <laughs> yeah, an intensity to <laughs> usually just gags from us. So let's go around and talk about the first time that we saw signs and maybe if we had anything with aliens or what we believe in. Yeah. Rob, did, you, did you see the signs? Did it open up your mind? You saw signs? I was going to make a Ace of Base reference. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> so I never saw the sign. I never opened you've up never, my eyes. You've never seen signs? Sign. No, I, I didn't what? see it. No, I, you know, I loved the first two. I mean, I loved Sixth Sense and Unbreakable. And I, I guess I might have missed... I can't remember whether Mel Gibson was already awful at this point. Maybe that was the reason? Not, I mean, we'll get into it maybe a bit more later, but to give you a bit of a a context, this movie came out in 2002. Right. Passion of the Christ came out in 2004. Right. And I believe his DUI where he said that Jews were responsible for all the wars in the world was (laughs) 2006. Oh, okay. So just to give you a little... Right. Bit of a timeline for Mel Gibson. It's hard awfulness. because our like feelings have changed about him. But I, yeah. for some reason, I Wait, missed what? this movie. Oh, you mean since then? Not, since it's then, not like yeah. we're okay with him now because no. he's in Daddy's Home too. <laughs> I, I thought that's why we were doing this. <laughs> no, I know. I, I saw the trailer for that, and I like see like John Lithgow and Will Ferrell. They're just like keeping an eye on him so he doesn't say anything bad. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I actually like. I, I've been doing some writing for another podcast, and I spent the day researching the atrocities of Mel Gibson for oh a piece. And then 
forgot. I was like, okay, time to distract myself with this week's podcast movie. <laughs> and I had to look oh, at man. Mel Gibson for two yeah. hours more. Yeah. But for some reason... Everywhere you turn, he's yeah. there. <laughs> but for some reason... He's I on my roof outside my window. <laughs> I didn't see this movie, and then, like, M. Night Shyamalan became ridiculous. Right. Like, his movie... People just started to question whether or not he was a good director. Yeah. So I didn't see this one, and I sort of thought that maybe this was maybe on the precipice of him starting to become ridiculous or something. So I never saw it, was sort of interested in it, but just never got around to it. As to the other question, I, I haven't personally had any experiences with the UFOs or anything like that. My dad's really into a lot of the subject matter, and I remember definitely having, like, old alien magazines lying around the house and uh, spending a lot of time watching the skies and, you know, looking to see what lights were moving and in what sort of patterns. So I, the subject matter, I think, is interesting to me as well. I don't know whether I believe in all of, uh, in everybody's, like, story about encountering aliens. You don't think Jodie Foster's dad is out there on a planet somewhere? <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> My you, dad's on a planet somewhere. <laughs> <laughs> what about you, Jam? I saw this movie in the theater. Yeah. Because I really liked M. Night at this time. And I really liked this movie at the time. I remember not liking the ending because mm. it felt like the twist had become such a prescribed component of his movies. And, uh, I was so into it when they were just kind of barricading themselves in the basement, which we'll get into, obviously. Oh, great scene. Great. Yeah, yeah, so I great felt like the end just kind of uh, – <laughs> it felt like like something that was tacked on out of some kind of need to fulfill the audience's expectations that there would be a twist. Mm -hmm. But I remember really liking – really the music especially stuck out for me. The, yeah. the haunting uh, music felt yeah. very Twilight zone -y. Mm, yeah. Uh So yeah, I really like this movie. As for the UFO question, yeah, I, I've never had any experiences. I, I don't know that I would – qualify myself as as a believer per se i do remember when i was a kid <laughs> we had a book about ufos in like our school library yeah, yeah i mean when i was like seven or eight and i just thought everything and it was true because it was a book and it was in the <laughs> library i just assumed it was there to <laughs> educate me right. and i didn't realize so much later that it was like oh there's there's probably it was just one of those picture books they probably got it like the discount section of the you know coals <laughs> mm -hmm. or whatever but uh, yeah i've, I've certainly always been drawn to stories of, of UFOs and, and the paranormal, even though I, I don't necessarily count myself among the believers. Uh, what about you, Blaine? I, you can be honest. <laughs> well, uh, <laughs> we're, taken. we're in a safe space. Honest here, yeah. if I've seen signs here or not. But, you know, I saw signs when it came out. I loved it. I loved Eminem Shalaman a lot, and I'm still a, a Shyamalan apologist. I think he's so great. And, and yeah, I do. Oh, okay. Yeah. And... I think he's a great writer, and I think when he's given time to like come up with a good script, he, he usually does. And I love his direction, especially in this movie, so we'll talk about that. But, yeah, I, I liked it. I wanted my friends to watch it. It made me want to watch all the rest of his movies. Unbreakable was so good that, like, I don't know. I just, I just like everything he does. And as for the alien question... You can be honest. I, <laughs> I no, I used to. I used to be a person that definitely believed in that. You lost your faith when I was, <laughs> and you guys are here to you, haunt me. You've never talked about your wife's passing on the show before, have you? <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, when I was a teenager, I, I mean, I wanted to be an astronaut. I loved. I, ha I got all the books out from my grade school library on astronomy, and they were all alien books beside them. So I was like, yeah, this don't is trust books. I know that's the worst thing. But yeah, so I was obsessed with aliens when I was a kid. I watched every episode of X-Files twice. I watched the alien autopsy on Fox and convinced my friends on the schoolyard that like it was real. I was, they were only wearing wristwatches because, you know, they had wristwatch technology in the government years before they released them. <laughs> exactly. And I, and I Digital find, wristwatches, I mean. Yeah, exactly. I know, I know wristwatches have been around for a while. <laughs> I find that stuff all really intriguing now. Like, I listened to your, um, Ryan, your episode on the Andreasen incident. And, mm -hmm. yeah, it, that stuff is still fascinating to me. Whether, yeah, I was listening to that, too. Yeah. yeah. And, and whether the, oh, cool. whether there's any kind of, like, factual evidence for it or not, I still like that the rumor is out there to make us think that, you know, there could be something more. And I kind of like that. So what about you, Ryan? Uh, when did you first see Science? 
Yeah, so uh, just like you, I did see this in theaters. I tried to pull everyone I could think of to go see this. Friends, family, anyone I could possibly think. My baseball coach. I just wanted people <laughs> to go see this thing and be like, Leave me alone, kid. Just- yeah. <laughs> uh, <laughs> swing and a miss. You're asking me to go see a movie. Yeah. <laughs> um, it's like Field of Dreams if someone did something else to the cornfield. <laughs> <laughs> Yes, many people believe this is a sequel, actually. Yeah. <laughs> you, like, show it to your coach, and you're like, see, I was supposed to hit that kid with the baseball bat. Yeah, swing yeah. away. Come on. Swing away. <laughs> uh, but, yeah, I, I did see it in theaters, and by the end of the movie, I kind of had that same feeling of that tacked-on ending or whatnot of, oh, okay, this isn't really what I was expecting. So, uh, yeah. so But I did. I did really enjoy the film for what it was, for kind of the – the theories that M. Night brought to it in terms of like the mythology behind you, ufology, you know, the study of UFOs, the decades and decades of research into crop circles and UFOs and alien abductions. Um, they did their homework, definitely, for sure. But we can definitely get into that. Yeah, you know, yeah. We didn't even really talk about crop circles so much in our intro. But yeah, this is kind of like all coming from the sort of, I guess, some of them have been exposed as hoaxes, the whole yeah. crop circle phenomenon. Phenomenon. What maybe you can illuminate? What what is kind of the history of crop circles that he be, that yeah. he's kind of riffing on? So I mean, crop circles have been around for centuries at this point. It's a very Eurocentric sort of thing. Um, they were seen all over England, and like you said, yeah, a lot of them have been proven to be hoaxed by people who go out there at night and they use these wooden boards and attach yeah. them to their feet and they're stomping the corn down. And they do. They they get groups of ten, twenty people to go out and do this, make these very intricate designs that take all night and precise measurements and there's a lot sounds of fun. <laughs> it sounds so fun can you imagine like just getting drunk and going out and doing this and then the next day people are saying oh my god aliens are invading it, it seems like a really good time they clearly did because <laughs> it kind of doesn't even really make sense like even in this movie where the crop circles are made by the aliens uh, that, that should have been the twist like oh no it was just the drunken neighbors <laughs> it has nothing to do with the aliens the wolfingtons yeah yeah no right. but cuz they say like oh they were using them as maps and it's like yeah. well how did they master space travel but they don't have like gps or like why is that the <laughs> yeah. best method yeah. for also just use an arrow you know it's more specific <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> i thought like the crop circles were supposed to be like where the spaceship landed and flattened the corn is that not what no because they no they because they're no, intricate I mean, like in, designs oh in in history in history maybe yeah i mean the yeah, first it, ones before they got all fancy right. before they got super yes yeah, before super banksy intricate. got into it yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's like doing latte art for your drink you know <laughs> but yeah there's many theories on you know why why these things are showing up if they were alien you know is it a message if so what kind of message are they conveying with these super weird things like who's going to decipher this so i thought it was interesting in the movie how that it was a map that they used to look at from above as they're invading so i yeah. actually really enjoyed m night's take on that for sure or whether that's true to any actual theories on what it could be who knows and honestly, yeah. like, <laughs> there's so many theories nobody really knows anyway. So I, I enjoyed yeah. that aspect of it. Great. Well, let's get into the movie. Let's uh, do, do a little bit of a rundown, Rob. Okay. So it sort of starts with Mel Gibson. He wakes up. Ugh. I know. <laughs> <laughs> Already. <laughs> he hears a scream and he, like, you know, his kids are, like, calling for him. So he, like, wakes up his little brother, Joaquin Phoenix, mm-hmm. and they go running out into the cornfield. And he's realized that someone has flattened his corn. <laughs> And I, that makes him really upset. <laughs> it takes a while to grow. You know? Yeah. Yeah. It's well, annoying. you know, is he farming that corn? Oh, yeah. Maybe I, it isn't his corn. I was confused about that because he's like yeah. a priest. Mm-hmm. Yeah. There's no farmer in his family unless the little kids are farming. I don't know. They don't seem to go to school. Hey, yeah. That's confusing. <laughs> yeah. It's a pretty yeah. big plot hole. We don't know whose farm this is. You know, is this plot Mel circle. Gibson's livelihood? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 Maybe his wife was a corn farmer. Oh, yeah. <laughs> it's really sexist of us not to assume that his wife could be a <laughs> corn farmer. My <laughs> wife planted this corn before she died. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But and anyway, so it's like this weird like symbol and Mel Gibson 
I mean, the character doesn't know what to think, but, you know, we bet Mel Gibson probably has his ideas of what these weird <laughs> symbols were made by. <laughs> Some of the jokes just are too obvious. Yeah. God damn. But so he actually thinks it's like probably just some local kids or something like that. So we like call somebody. But then some other weird stuff starts happening, like... The dog pees on the floor. <laughs> so the weirdest thing weird. to happen in this movie. It's yeah. pretty, it's pretty spooky. <laughs> and you know, we get to sort of like see his like family a little bit. We get like his kids. There is Little Miss Sunshine and yeah. little, the youngest Culkin. Little Culkin. Rory, I believe his name is. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Are they all the weird now? Did they all turn weird, or is it just like they all have bands? They all have food related <laughs> yeah. Blue Reed bands. <laughs> 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 But animals seem to be acting weird. Like, at mm-hmm. one point, the dog, like, attacks, like, the kid, and they have to, like, stab the dog. Yeah, the, the kid, kid stabs the, the dog. The, the kid takes down a dog. Yeah, it's crazy. <laughs> they're, they're weird kids. Yeah. He's working his way up to uh, battling home invaders, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> micro machines. <laughs> uh, so he, he files a police report. We got like the police officer. I don't know if yeah. she's the sheriff or whatever. She's a great actor. I've seen her in like a bunch of stuff. I like she's her. She's the professor on Transparent. Yeah. Oh, yeah. She? And I was yeah. like, why is she so familiar? And she's in an realized. episode of Black Mirror, too, as like a trucker. Oh. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Cherry Jones, yeah, yeah, right. she's yeah, so yeah, she's great. great. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I kind of didn't like her in this. Well, oh, really? No, <laughs> it's hard because M Night Shyamalan gets the most wooden performances from. He's like, "Hey, what you're doing is acting, and I don't like it. Stop it. <laughs> <laughs> Just say the lines well, without any emotion. Yeah, Act in a weird, stilted way. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, maybe is it okay to talk about it now? Because it is weird how still and yeah, like dry and airless everything is right yeah. off the bat. Yeah. Like I was watching, uh, my wife watched the beginning of it with me, and you know seeing it now as parents like the scene where the kid has stabbed the dog yeah and Mel Gibson just kind of slowly walks over and stands there for several minutes right. just like <laughs> right. what happened <laughs> he fell on he us fell and on you're us. like a parent would stab that dog again and again well, you'd run over the- you'd hug your kid like oh my god what happened like holy yeah. shit you stabbed a dog yeah. are you yeah. okay you have PTSD <laughs> too bad you don't have a mom to comfort you <laughs> <laughs> just rubbing in his kids faces all the time yeah Everything and, seems very posed. Yeah, yeah, and like and like the dialogue is like very like scripty. Like he fell on us. Yeah. Well, and it's the dog attacked us. <laughs> and other filmmakers do it too. Like Largos uh, Lanthimos or what? Oh, Yorgos yeah. Lanthimos. Yeah, the yeah. guy who does. Uh, I just saw Sacred Deer. Yeah. Oh, was it good? oh cool. I kind of liked it. Yeah. Okay. Nice. <laughs> yeah, and the lobster was was a big one. Yeah. Um, mm, yeah. He he does like really still scenes and people don't emote at all, but like when they do, they do. And that's like they break, and that's so lovely to watch. Yeah. And it's kind of played for comedy. But yeah, I think it's supposed to be funny. Yeah. yeah. I don't think this is supposed to be funny. No, no, no. I, yeah, I don't know. I mean, some parts it's are It's interesting. To be funny. Yeah. I mean, this takes place in what? Uh, Pennsylvania, I believe it is. 45 miles outside of yeah, Pittsburgh. Oh, right. Yeah. 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 They so give the exact very... location. Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's very rural town. I wonder, like, is this. A family who's so down on what's going on around them. You've got like the failed baseball player in Joaquin Phoenix. You've got the failed priest, as it were. Um, and these two kids who are just so naive at the time, like they have no idea what's going on. I, I feel like, yeah, the energy in the beginning of this movie is just non-existent. And then as it progresses, we'll get some pretty, some pretty uh, emotional scenes with Mel Gibson later on in the film. But yeah, yeah. it is very interesting how dull. They seem to be in the beginning. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and like the colors kind of washed out of it too. Like it's a pretty dull movie to, to start I'm with. I'm glad that these crop circles showed up. Jesus, give these people <laughs> yeah. their life. Yeah. Well, I was glad that dog peed on the floor. Yeah. yeah. Add some color to the scene. Yeah. yeah. Well, I think as we'll find out, it all happened for a reason. It was meant to be. <laughs> <laughs> but Cherry Jones is kind of the first person that comes in and gives – some comedy to it because she's saying that like there are women high jumpers that could oh, jump yeah, on that the roof. Oh yeah, that was so weird. Yeah, it's it's weird, but it's meant to be weird. I, I, I don't know. Okay, well, yeah. So we should say Mel Gibson sees an alien outside of his yeah. window and runs out. Yeah, yeah. And, and chasing him. Yeah, and then they're like presumably because he thinks he's some kind of minority. <laughs> 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 well, aliens on this planet are. He is. Yeah, yeah. That's true. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh, maybe this is a metaphor. Yeah. 
Oh shit! <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but she yeah she's like says like you know are you sure that it was a man you saw? Couldn't have been a woman. Yeah. And then Joaquin Phoenix is like, it sure wasn't no woman because I haven't seen a woman run like that or something like that. Yeah. And then she's like, well, I've seen women Olympians <laughs> and they got them <laughs> Swedish high jumpers. <laughs> yeah. I, but you know what? I kind of like that for her character because she's a small town cop that's probably had to talk about what women can do for the longest time. I don't know. I like it. it, yeah, I it but weird. I feel like if it, she was a real person. She'd be like, well, I can run pretty fast. I'm a police officer. <laughs> She's like, I saw the Olympics once and there were women on and it. Yeah, no, no. Women. <laughs> it is strange. It's well, really weird. And then Joaquin calls, kind of calls her out for it. He's like, yeah, can we get past this to talk about what really happened? I did read that one of the original designs for the aliens was going to be like this a high femin- jumper. Yeah, it was going to be literally just Swedish high jumpers. <laughs> no, it, it was... <laughs> it jumped too high. It went to another planet. <laughs> uh, no, it was going to be like this more feminine physique. Yeah. Maybe to play with the idea that it's all a metaphor for Mel Gibson's haunted, you know, being haunted by his dead wife, almost like a oh Solaris God. thing, maybe. Oh, right, yeah. But also that would make that scene make a little more sense if it was kind of could it could have been construed as mm-hmm. as possibly a female. Right. But they're character. not. The guy is like six feet tall and he's on a roof. Yeah. You can and, and, of, he ran. and he ran. And he ran. Unlike, you know, th- that thing women don't do. <laughs> <laughs> Except for in the Olympics. Well, they have those heels on all the time. <laughs> yeah. They could do it in Jurassic World, so. <laughs> yeah. Anything's possible. Okay. We're going to be back with Ryan Sprague in one second talking about maybe what actual aliens might look like. Hi, I'm Kimberly, producer at Entertainment One's Podcast Network. When I'm waiting in line for a coffee or catching up on housework, I love a new podcast. Decode the mysteries of UFOs with Somewhere in the Skies. Or if you're feeling risque, check out Turn Me On for a no-holds-barred conversation on sexuality and relationships. You can listen to all of Entertainment One's podcasts on Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, or wherever you get your podcasts. Okay, we're back with Rewatchability and Ryan Sprague from Somewhere in the Skies podcast. So we've talked a lot about what the alien looked like in this movie. What What's kind of the theories behind or what have people seen in abductions and stuff in your experience, Ryan? Yeah, are they like uh, feminine? Yeah, are they Swedish <laughs> high jumpers that don't like water? I mean, okay. are they available? <laughs> <laughs> are they on Tinder? Yeah. <laughs> Tinder for aliens. <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, it really runs the gamut here, guys. I mean, I've heard everything from these prototypical greys, these small, you know, skinny, very androgynous creatures with the big black eyes. We know it. It's so big in pop culture. That's the main one that I've come across. And they seem to be like drone-like almost that – they don't have any emotion. They're just sort of acting very robotically. Um, Are we sure they're not in an M. Night Shyamalan man movie? Because <laughs> that, that could be the... Yeah, he's directing them. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But the, they it's never really, wear pants. They never <laughs> wear pants. Yeah. They're like Donald the Duck. It's fine. Yeah. Donald the Duck? <laughs> yeah. Donald the Duck. He never wears pants. It's just Donald Duck. There's no the... He's not, he's not His Donald last the Duck. name's Duck. <laughs> I think it's because your mom bought you some weird off-brand Disney products <laughs> where they couldn't say Donald Duck. <laughs> yeah, and Neptune the dog. It's fine. It's all. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. So, so uh, we have the, like the grays. I know they're kind of like the tall green guys too, which is kind of tall. Seems- Green reptilians, yeah, th- these lizard-like creatures. Um, well, those are, are just our very... overlords that control <laughs> exactly. the government, right? Yeah, they have a human mask on. When are they going to do something about Donald Trump? <laughs> 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 you think our lizard overlords would be getting a little bit yeah. concerned? <laughs> the Democrats? Yeah, I mean, <laughs> probably. That's literally where we are right now. <laughs> Guys, I mean, as an American, if they haven't done it by now, I have no faith in these higher intelligences. As they... uh, that being said, you know, so those are another one. And then these – it's funny you mentioned the, the sort of Swedish tall thing. That's another big one in alien mythology are these Nordic-like uh, tall, blonde, blue-eyed 
humanoid looking things that are often reported in abduction experiences okay. overseeing what these little gray aliens are doing to the humans so it, it's fascinating <laughs> oh, wow. oh man they're complicit. an interesting thing yeah, yeah yeah they're all working together this galactic federation i didn't know that white supremacy was like intergalactic <laughs> <laughs> it is galactic man at this point <laughs> <laughs> wow so at this point, like they've started, it's not just happening to them in the movie. Like they've started, there's been other occurrences that they see on TV. Like um, I think at this point, there's like a whole bunch of ships over Mexico City. Oh, yeah. And they're yeah. just sort of like floating there. Yeah, they can't get into the States because of that wall. <laughs> <laughs> it's 20 feet high. They'll build it bigger. It's That's fine. what it's to keep out aliens. <laughs> right, yeah. It's not on the news. <laughs> and. We we yeah we also learned like a bunch of stuff about like the characters too like Joaquin Phoenix character used to be a baseball player. Well, yeah. in another weird scene, they all go into town oh, and these, they all kind of split off and it's get the these. Thing. It's such weird scenes. Like the the scene with Joaquin Phoenix is and the it, army guy. He, the yeah, recruiter. he's considering army recruiter. Office. Yeah. yeah, I guess mm-hmm. he's considering joining the army to fight the aliens. Sure. I don't know why this is coming up now, but, but that's that Independence Day. The army guy's one of those weird things where he's like, hey, don't I know you from somewhere? And then a minute later, he's like, hey, you're Meryl, whatever. It's like, mm-hmm. I saw you do this. And then he knows all his statistics. It's like, yeah. wow, you really jumped from not knowing him at all to knowing <laughs> everything about him. <laughs> yeah. yeah. But then he doesn't weird, know man. that he, like, sucks at, at swinging. Like, right. Yeah. yeah. That's like, his I'm statistics. really far. <laughs> But also, it's, it's like the weird dialogue because he says something like, hey, why aren't you like in a bed full of money with women licking your toes? Oh, it's man. Like, who what? thinks that's and, a thing? And weirdly delivered because <laughs> this actor is taking like such delicacy with every line is so weird. It's like, yeah. I know you. It's such a weird delivery. Yeah. If, I, if, the, if the reveal had been that that was an alien who had yeah. <laughs> killed the real <laughs> army guy in town, I would not yeah. have been surprised. Yeah. yeah he was right. sitting in Ikea furniture. And then. And if the scene wasn't weird enough, a guy that we hadn't seen in the scene prior, played by Michael Showalter for some reason, is like, he's a terrible baseball player. He swung at every pitch. And then Joaquin Phoenix says, felt wrong not to swing. At which point I said, then you do not understand baseball. That's not how baseball works. (laughs) I understand it's a a nice metaphor, but it's literally not how the game is played. It's like a race car driver. Felt wrong not to crash. It's like, you don't know the whole thing of your sport it's like a hockey player being like i don't want to use a stick Uh, (laughs) it's a metaphor for life or something (laughs) this was like the most the meanest way to give exposition to a character ever i fucking (laughs) hated learning about these characters because it was always delivered in this really (laughs) odd stilted way yeah Uh, let's get the guy from stella to shit talk joaquin phoenix for some reason i could i could oh like i I was like that can't be him it's so it must be like just someone who looks like him because it's such a bit role in this weird movie like it's not anything up his alley he's never done another movie like this i don't think so yeah it's so weird and the yeah. next thing weird thing that happens after that is because they're all in town and they see m night Shyamalan <laughs> <Yeah>. coming <laughs> walking to his like car with some groceries and then they're like is that him yeah <laughs> like yes the director that, that yes. <laughs> that's the man making this terrible movie it feels like a scene from like you know like a Freaky '60s postmodern play where all, everyone realizes they're in a movie. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> is that our author? <laughs> yeah. But then, like, what we find out eventually is it's not just like a cameo, like a Hitchcockian cameo, where he like you know shows up holding groceries and then we're never going to yeah. see him again. <laughs> or like an Unbreakable when he's like a doctor, or like a, in Sixth Sense. Yeah. yeah, like Mel Gibson's big thing is that he lost his faith when his wife died. She died in this terrible car accident, and we yeah. later find out— And we don't know how terrible it is yet. Oh, it's no. It's so terrible. Give M. Night Shyamalan credit. He definitely, like, ramps it up and, like, feeds us the information a little bit. Oh, it's so great. But we find out that M. Night Shyamalan is the guy who killed his wife. Well, he needed to start the story somehow. <laughs> you know? <laughs> yeah, but he, he probably uh, actually did kill someone's wife. <laughs> And he yeah. said, it's all happening for a reason. I want to put in a swimming pool. <laughs> this movie's going to be big. <laughs> it's it's it, weird. It is weird. It's really weird. And I learned recently that uh, M. Night actually didn't tell Mel Gibson that he was going to be playing that role until moments <laughs> before they started filming. No so kidding. That, <laughs> he would have been like, That's what? Weird. You can't get me like uh, Ian Holm or somebody? <laughs> 
It does Andy. feel like these first, like this first run of movies that he had, he was almost just like making movies to Trojan horse his acting career in a way. <laughs> yeah. Like he's just building up a reel for himself and accidentally making hit movies. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, at least Sylvester Stallone did it in earnest. You're like, all right, yeah, that's, yeah. that's good. I know what you're doing. Yeah. Yeah, like, and, have you shown James Cameron my audition? <laughs> <laughs> the other problem is he's not very good. Oh, yeah. He's, he's the most wooden of them all. It's like he's. <laughs> it's like he gives line readings yeah. to everyone. They're like, oh, just do it like that. But he's actually just a bad actor. That's why he directs <laughs> actors in that way. He's like, he doesn't want anyone to give a better performance than him. <laughs> <You're> right. <laughs> that's great. But yeah. My other big thing is when, he, when we realize that he is the person who killed killed his wife, Mel Gibson's wife. Accidentally. Is he not? Yeah, it was an accident. But I mean, was there no repercussion to that? I know he feels that inner guilt, but you know, it seems like he's just running around town, getting his groceries. You know, Putting he seems to be pantry. the only non. I think he lives next door. Town. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know wouldn't he I at mean? least get like his license suspended or something? <laughs> yeah, you, you do have to wonder. Yeah. If I, like, killed some guy's wife in my town, I would probably relocate. Okay. <laughs> well, yeah. Also, in one... Or apologize. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> or apologize. <laughs> well, that's the other thing. We find out that later in the movie, he hasn't, apo- he's, he's hasn't apologized. He's been waiting to apologize all this time. So, yeah, it's just weird. I just thought I would, you know, see you randomly and stare at you weirdly. <laughs> yeah, and then I'd, you know, say, sorry, and you'd be like, cool. I'm and sorry for locking it. you in the bathroom. No, I, you killed my wife. <laughs> oh, right, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> but the, then, okay, we should probably get into some of the themes of the movie. And yeah. the way I want to go about that is by mentioning, well, first, there's the conversation between Mel Gibson and Joaquin Phoenix, where, you know, Mel Gibson's kind of talking about how he lost his faith and saying, like, you know, there are people that see, you know, see things and think they're luck, think some they happen signs, for a reason. Yeah. Other see signs. Some mm-hmm. people just see coincidence. Some people don't see signs and then they kill somebody in their car. <laughs> <laughs> Is that what this movie's about? Yeah, there was a speed limit sign right there. Uh, no, but... The, then M. Night, when M. Night Shyamalan talks to Mel Gibson, it's like, I'm so sorry and, and all that because he's kind of called him to his house. And then he says, he's describing, you know, he's on that road and there was no car for miles. He's never yeah. fallen asleep before. And he's like, it's like it almost happened for a reason. Yeah. And if I was like Mel Gibson, I'd be like, be. fuck you. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Boom. Punch right in the face. Yeah, like we know he has a temper. Why isn't he using it now? <laughs> it's tough. That's so insulting to say to someone. Yeah, Don't I know. you think? Yeah. yeah. No, well, it's pretty kept, bad. They keep saying, like, it was meant to be. Like, that's the phrase that you say when you, like, fall in love with somebody. <laughs> yeah. You know, yeah. like, I saw him from across the room, and, you know, I just knew it was meant to be. <laughs> I was meant to kill his wife. Yeah. <laughs> yeah exactly. In the most brutal, gruesome way possible, which we'll get oh, to. Oh, yeah. My God. Yeah. It, I, I feel like that's an interesting observation because we often hear you know with religion and whatnot playing a big role in this like oh it it was you know it was meant to be like god wanted this to happen and i often you know say to myself isn't that just an excuse for the way humans behave is you're you're pinning the blame on something else yeah does everyone Um, who suffers tragedy have this are there always (laughs) clues given out (laughs) before someone dies (laughs) and like animals going to alien invasion yeah yeah Yeah, exactly yeah like uh, i don't know your dog pees on the floor (laughs) yeah (laughs) call around then your wife's about to divorce you so (laughs) watch it i don't know i just found that kind of insulting yeah, no, oh, it's, yeah, it's pretty sure. bad. The other thing that I found insulting was that he just says, oh, and they don't like water, Boom, and <laughs> drives away. <laughs> and I was like, as a as a viewer, I was like, well, shit. Like, we could have kind of maybe figured that out later in the movie without you saying it. He also says he caught one in his pantry. Yeah. yeah. And then mm, Mel Gibson yeah. goes in and, you know, takes a look at it. I kind of feel like the other thing... Which is a great scene. I really like that scene, personally. But, like, are people doing this all over the world? Because on the news, they never say, like, we caught one and here's what it looks like. It's always just, like, shaky birthday party. <laughs> but, like, this random veterinarian is able to capture one? So I don't know. Yeah. It just felt like, almost like I wish they had had just Well, what did TV... he have in his pantry? You know? That's the question. Mm-hmm. Like alien well, bait. that 
that's a good point too. Again, like you guys mentioned earlier, these things, whatever they are, traveled how far to get here. They have the the intelligence to do that to get here, and then they're getting locked in a wooden pantry and they can't figure a way out. Yeah. Or, you know, they can't yeah. just they they don't know that this one thing on Earth supposedly is their their weakness, which again we'll get to. But <laughs> the thing that covers seventy five percent of the globe. <laughs> How dumb these aliens are! Why did they pick this planet? If like you said, seventy five percent of this planet is what could feasibly kill them. It just it, yeah. that part and there's amazing. humidity. Yeah, and also that's like a myth <laughs> clearly off of War of the Worlds, like with yeah. the uh, with the with air. the germs. But yeah. that that's a little different. And the other thing is well, like it's a little better because <laughs> sure. at the end of the wells come on you know at the end of the movie they shut themselves in and are the aliens are trying to attack their house Mm -hmm. what what's what it's the aliens plan they're just like they're going house to house and i think it's spooky killing everybody they they need to steal the souls of asthmatic children (laughs) that's clearly what is happening in that one scene look i I don't want to be a bother but our ship is powered by the asthmatic gasps of small children (laughs) you got any culkins around (laughs) but the, the other thing like because I really liked this movie when I was younger, like I said, but I feel like a lot of people were turned off. A lot of people that weren't religious were turned off by what they thought was very kind of preachy. Yeah, it was a religious message. Religious. Yeah. And I always saw it, I kind of dug it because I saw it almost more as a, a metaphor. It was almost more about like believing in yourself or not doubt, not like uh, torpedoing your whole sure. life and your path just because, you know, tragedy befalls you. Yeah. And just the idea of a priest losing faith is kind of like a very extreme version of that story. Mm. Yeah. So I kind of connected mm-hmm. to that. But watching it now, like with the thing, you know, saying like, oh, it was meant to be and and all that. And at the end, Mel Gibson says, like, someone did save us or something. Like, yeah. it felt more preachy to me now than it did then well and that's what happens when you have like a theme that you're that you're setting up and you're really strong arming it and you want everyone to know what your theme is like why does he have to be like a priest yeah (laughs) yeah and why does king phoenix have to be like the best baseball hitter (laughs) yeah well uh, yeah because like other movies have themes and then we can pick them apart on podcasts like this and it's really fun to like get into the nitty-gritty on that but this there's no there's no wiggle room for people to kind of talk about the theme and be like, yeah. maybe it meant this and maybe he saw signs here. No, right. it's called signs. And, and, and he says some people look for signs. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> and the other thing is, is that like the kind of problem with all of M. Night Shyamalan's movies, which I think we've talked about, is that like, yeah, they sort of rely on like this on these writing tricks. Right. Yeah. But I mean, they're just kind of like it's just they're just sort of tricks, you know, when once you sort of like see the mechanism and like it's easy for M. Night Shyamalan as an author to like write in all these coincidences at the beginning and then sort of fill them out at the end. But in a fiction film like that doesn't seem like a miracle. That just seems like, oh, he like made a very easy connection. (laughs) Yeah. Well, not even cleverness. Well, I I think that the, there was a twist in Unbreakable and there was a twist in uh, Sixth Sense. I don't know if I'd call this a twist. I think that's what kind of really people hated from this movie, too, was because they went to see a big twist at the end. And this was just kind of like all these things are coming together. And now you understand what we've been saying the entire movie. Or should we get into the ending then? What yeah. happens yeah. at the end? Because after yeah. they barricade themselves in and it seems like the aliens have left. Yeah. The aliens just sort of like leave on their own accord around mm-hmm. the world. Yeah, but they leave someone behind. Yeah, well, they leave. Well, they leave <laughs> like ET. Yeah, yeah, the news tells like us another that Culkin, you know? people are that the wounded have been left behind. Yeah, and so they're still like attacking. And at one point, like <laughs> they're still raiding pantries, which was their main objective. <laughs> if you got caught in a pantry, we don't want you on our arm anymore. We're out of here. Well, so the, yeah, they they just, like spend the night in, barricaded, and like Mel Gibson has his like crisis of faith. Maybe we should, like, play a clip from that. Sure. Yeah. Breathe like me. Come on. I this. Stay with me. I know. It hurts. Be strong, baby. It'll pass. It'll pass. Do this to me again. Not again. I hate you. I hate you. 
It's like, you know, some powerful Mel Gibson-y acting. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, it's, you know, it's hard to, like, sympathize with him, but, yeah. Well, he, as an actor, for sure. <laughs> but as his character, I don't know, I think it's kind of easy. For me, it was easy to sympathize with his character. Well, no, for sure. Like, he's, like, trying to, his kid's having an asthma attack, God. and he doesn't have the medication, and he can't go to get it because the alien's out there. And mm-hmm. so he's, like, holding his child to his chest and trying to get him to relax. Well, and, and saying, like, please don't do this to me again. Like, yeah. Like, that's, that's that, like... That's that thing where he starts to believe again right then and there because he's he thought he was at rock bottom, but this is worse. And I think that's what people do with religion. They turn to it when they're when they're not feeling great. And so <laughs> it's I think it's it's that it's that moment that I think is so beautiful in the film when he hates God, but because he hates God, he believes in him. And so there's this kind of like thing where he believes again, but also he hates that he believes again at the same yeah. time. And I think that's a really beautiful moment. Yeah. Um, but then, so they survive the night and they go out and the alien is still around or he actually like sees the reflection in the TV. <laughs> the alien's just watching TV. He just wants yeah. to uh, see what's on, you know? <laughs> yeah. Try to find his fingers. And he like, so he like <laughs> picks up the alien picks up Rory Culkin and is, like, holding him, like, but he's about to take his bride over the threshold or something <laughs> like that. Yeah. Well, I, I kind of like I kind of like the way he's holding him because it's reminiscent of every alien abduction ever where people are pulled up by their chests and their arms and legs are kind of splayed out to the side. I thought that was kind of, like, a cool image. But he's also, the alien is also, like, you know, like, sort of, like, rhythmically sort of, like, moving he's in dancing. a sort of weird it's, sort of dance It's a way. samba. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And then that, he has, like... I was just going to add, guys, That's this is the part where I think the movie kind of really let everyone down because it was all CGI. And up to this point, you know, he was pretty ambiguous with these aliens. Like We, right. we never truly see them. We see them in a small home video thing, right. which was terrifying in my yeah. opinion. It's but, like Jaws, uh, right? Yeah. yeah, exactly. But this is another case with, you know, many films where – they're showing so much at the end that like there's nothing left to the imagination at that point. Yeah. He tries like he tries to see the alien through this television screen, which really dims the alien. He tries to backlight the alien so we don't see too much definition. Like I feel like he tries as a director to to hide as much as he can, but still show the whole thing, which it, yeah. is hard. But there's so many great scenes earlier where we just get those glimpses like the the home video in, yeah. in Brazil and like when he's out in the cornfield and he just sees the leg yeah uh, it just kind of disappear and I come from, I and also the pantry scene I remember them all being like big jump scares yeah. but there's n- there's no sound no. accompanying them they're just but yeah you know I think people in the theater when I saw it were you know reacting as if there was a they crazy the noise sound. yeah yeah yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> they paid people to sit in the theater and go <laughs> ah! <laughs> like who the fuck is that yeah but the like I think like the the twist if yeah. it is a twist is that like you know all of the like coincidences are, are all like the you know, little minutia of like the movie, like yeah, he's a baseball player. Yeah, the the kid leaves the water around, and it's all to come down to this moment where he remembers the last line that his wife says, and there's like a, a, a flashback to it. While the alien is like holding the kid for like five minutes, he's I like, "Wait, I gotta remember my wife dying." <laughs> he remembers his whole life before he goes on stage. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> no, for sure. And then it's he, a long flashback. And then he puts together his wife's dying words were to tell him hey tell Joaquin Phoenix to beat that fucking alien to death with no, a baseball bat no no <laughs> Rob Rob he was she was vaguer than that so she actually just said swing away which was confusing for a while because it had no specifics oh <laughs> said uh, C C swing away Meryl. why didn't you say something about the aliens I told Meryl to sign up for swing dance lessons <laughs> he's swinging away down there we got a swing set in her backyard that I won't let him off it's horrible no but it's just to, I, I don't know actually I I still think the moment kind of works just because the formal elements of it are so great. The music's so great. The way it's edited. The direction is so great. It makes like, it feel like something is, yeah, it makes it feel like something huge is happening. Yeah, even the though, vertigo shot that goes right up to his face, like the extreme close up. Yeah. yeah I love you're it. like, yeah. I'm too close to Matt Gibson. <laughs> yeah, way too close for Matt Gibson. <laughs> I, I, I think my favorite line in this whole movie where you really get your heart pulled is when Mel Gibson says to the sheriff, you know, is this the last time I'm ever going to speak to my wife? In that moment of alone just got me so much and she says yes 
Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I can't imagine being in issues at that point. Of course I would lose my faith after that. But yeah, this whole flashback scene was very interesting. And then you get the whole swing away aspect, you know, supposedly in that moment of trauma to her and the neurons are, you know, firing in her brain and she thinks she's at one of Meryl's old baseball games. Well, but that's what he thinks yeah. is yeah. happening. Right, and then we find out, like, no, she's actually. <laughs> yeah. supposed to she's at St. Peter's Gates, and God's like, "Hey, but here's I, a message." I like the yeah. thing of like, I'm going to be sending aliens to Earth, and one of them is going to get like real close to killing your kids. So you better tell <laughs> Mel Gibson. Yeah, <laughs> but I like the idea of the daughter because she never finishes water because she says it's contaminated. So yeah. there are all these glasses Amoebas. of water yeah. in the room, and. That's yeah, you know, like we find out the aliens' weakness that they're able to use. I like that, yeah. but the swing away thing just seemed weird because it's like it almost feels like they shouldn't even need a clue to be like, "Hey, grab a baseball bat and beat the shit out of this thing." Yeah. Like, like, why do they need a hint? Use anything. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Use your fist for Christ's sakes! Like, oh, I wish you hadn't have said that because we had a gun upstairs. We could have gotten. <laughs> <laughs> I wasn't thinking about swinging away. I could have gotten the shotgun from the bedroom. Yeah, yeah. there was five minutes while I was just standing there. He had a long time to do that. My question is, if, like, all of this, like, trauma and everything, like, if, like, his whole wife's, like, basic existence was just for this, like, moment, mm -hmm. like, what the fuck's going to happen when they run into problems after this movie? <laughs> He's going to be like, oh, I remembered another thing my dead wife said. <laughs> she yeah. was dying. Signs, yeah. too. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and also sucks for the wife that, like, this was God's design and... I don't know. Maybe Mel Gibson could have gotten hit by the car and she could have hey, yeah. told Meryl yeah. to swing away. Or God could have been like, aliens, don't go to Earth. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, there's a lot of things. <laughs> there's a lot of things God could do. Well, I mean, that's the that brought up a lot of questions for me. Like, if this is indeed a movie where, like, God exists and God is doing all this for a reason, he must have sent the aliens. Why? <laughs> that seems yeah. like a pretty dick move. <laughs> And also, he wanted to ruin a five-year-old's birthday party. That's the only thing he wanted to do. It's like, <laughs> or make that five-year-old's birthday party awesome. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, we couldn't afford a magician, but look, yeah. it's a seven-foot-tall lizard man. <laughs> <laughs> I, I've got a pretty, I don't know, um, if you guys will entertain this, I've got a pretty big theory on why this all oh. may have happened. Okay. I, I don't know. So, it was because Mel Gibson was a piece of shit? <laughs> yeah, pretty much. <laughs> this, I, I, I feel like Bo, the, the little girl in this movie, is probably my favorite character by far. A lot of people have theorized that she is – even Mel Gibson says at one point, you know, when you were born, everyone just said how much of an angel you were and this and right. that. And then she's got this water all over the place. And the theories out there that – She's almost this angelic figure and that these aliens are demonic in a sense. And this is all a test of faith to see how humans would react. And we're so getting this sent by Satan. They're yeah. sent by Satan. Well, yeah, I, this was the first time I'd watched this movie since I'd read that theory, too. And it, it does factor into it. In the, especially I was noticing in the way everyone keeps talking about it, like it's the end of the world, mm -hmm. which is a weird way I'm to again. just react to like yeah. lights in the sky. Mm -hmm. So I think that's definitely there. Yeah. Well, and part of it, like even hearing them being like, well, we've, we've the three cities in like near Jerusalem figured it out. Like it's it kind of like, <laughs> yeah. it kind of feels like, well, we're trying mm -hmm. to do that. A you know? child was born. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. There's one big light in the sky. Yeah. It's uh, one guy led the way, but then we crucified him. Yeah. yeah. Mel Gibson crucified him. <laughs> well, <laughs> and it kind of, uh, Very violently. <laughs> and it kind of ta speaks to like, maybe they weren't allergic to water coming to this planet, but they were allergic to like holy water. And if, this young girl is an angel then she like already like sanctified this water and so all this water was holy water that they were splashing but M. Night Shyamalan with. says that they don't like water did he make holy water too he's just a veterinarian I don't know maybe <laughs> was he make holy water for dogs <laughs> he had like a holy water thing in his pantry yeah he had, that come in handy. he had a can of holy Pringles in the pantry <laughs> yeah. to do the alien yeah, yeah. <laughs> holy pork and beans yeah. I think the weird thing about like having like a faith based sort of message in this other than Mel Gibson being like kind of like a religious zealot, so it sort of feels uncomfortable, is that like by having M. Night Shyamalan in this movie and by having him play like such a integral role, I mean, metafilmically, he's God in this movie, right? Yeah. 
Definitely. And, like, because he had to kill that character's wife in order to start the story. Yeah. He told them how to get rid of the aliens so he knew something that and, no one else could possibly know. And he wrote a scene where everyone's like, it's him. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. He wanted to feel important on set for a day. Yeah, for sure. and, that's, and that's weird. And I don't know, just kind of lame, I think. <laughs> Ah, I don't know. I think it's kind of fun that he puts himself into the movies like Hitchcock did with like this whole like kind of spot him thing. Yeah, but if he could act. Mm -hmm. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's Uh, on one hand, I like it. Yeah. Hitchcock is a huge inspiration. I mean, that whole scene where the aliens are invading the home is right out of birds. There's no denying that whatsoever. Uh, And I I feel like, yeah, he he, he goes that extra step where it just becomes annoying when he has more than a minute of dialogue in his own movie. (laughs) Um, Whereas Hitchcock, you know, you just might see him in the background somewhere walking by or doing whatnot. Or in like a newspaper or something. Yeah. The other thing that occurred to me I wanted to mention is speaking of the birds, it felt a lot like like the the short story the birds which all mm. takes place in a farmhouse and is about a family mm. oh, so cool. in a way it almost feels like an alternate version of what the birds could have been that's cool yeah. that's a yeah. cool way to look at it too yeah yeah i mean yeah. it also borrows a lot in non hitchcock from war of the worlds like there is so uh, the original radio play not the and not the original radio play cuz it's from a book but the radio play version like oh well, that should have been the twist the twist should have been like they were just watching a mockumentary on tv <laughs> <laughs> yeah that's right they weren't paying enough attention to the commercials <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> media literacy folks <laughs> but like that part where they yeah they deliver like all of the news through i mean the news on tv like feels very much like like the radio program yeah yeah it's good uh, or also also, like, there's, like, little bits where they, you know, they're talking to, like, the people on the ground and they're just, like, regular people going about their lives and not knowing how to, like, sort of, like, deal with this sort of crisis. And that's sort of, like, feels like a, a microcosm of what's happening with Mel Gibson. Like, his isn't the main story. Mm-hmm. You know, he doesn't kill all the aliens and stop the invasion like Will Smith does. Right. He's, you know, just like a small sort of like adjacent sort of story, which was really mm-hmm. interesting. We barely even see like the alien get killed. Like, yeah, he, he kind of leaves the house with his kids and we see it through the window. Well, we can't see, <laughs> the you alien know, yeah. his smashed in face or whatever. <laughs> no, but the alien takes so many hits. It's really tough. <laughs> it's My question, tough. what do they do with that body? Like, did, yeah. did they oh, give yeah. it alien autopsy sure. buried in the cornfield? <laughs> Put a Did they bring it to it. Area 51? Yeah, you don't know at that point. It's like, what? where does Earth go from here? They were just invaded. We have an alien body. Like, what do we do now? Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. Science too. <laughs> <laughs> so do we want to go around and, and talk about if we thought this this movie was rewatchable, Rob? I'm going to be honest. I did not love this movie. And no. I sort of feel like... There are parts of it that I just don't want to like. Mm-hmm. I don't want to like the theme of like faith, and I don't want to like Mel Gibson, and I don't want to like an M. Night Shyamalan movie for some reason. So it's kind of hard to get around <laughs> There's a lot that. going against that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah I, and like so much of like the, the acting is like wooden and the script is like weird. But at the same time, like I feel like I should probably give it another shot at some other time. And maybe I might enjoy it. At that point, but I don't know. I I was really on the fence. I'm going to say like mildly rewatchable because I think there's a lot of really good stuff in here. I think even Mel Gibson's pretty good, but I just it's not. I don't know. It was kind of a chore to watch. Mm. Yeah. What about you, Jam? That music's so good. I love it's the so music. <laughs> I think there's Over the opening credits too. Yeah, like just that little touch of piano and yeah. yeah, it's it's great music. There are some scenes I just think are fantastic, like that scene where. He's out in the cornfield and he sees the leg. Yeah. Uh, I just, I thought we're so suspenseful and so scary. And, and the restraint that they have by making them silence. And I, I don't know. And if it had ended with, uh, you know, without, with just them in that basement or, you know, what have you, I think it would be a better movie. Also, Mel Gibson's hard to watch. I, <laughs> yeah. I, it's hard. I mean, I feel like I can still watch Lethal Weapon because it's just like, he just feels like Riggs. Mm-hmm. But watching a movie where I, I'm less, I know the character less, it just feels like, ah, oh, it's just that guy I don't like. Yeah. And now he's in movies again. And it's, <laughs> it's weird. I hope he's not listening. <laughs> uh, no. <laughs> I hope he is listening. He's Fuck you, Mel fan. Gibson. Uh, <laughs> no, I, I don't know. So it's 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 a, a, a lot of contradictions watching this movie. And I, I do feel like I, you know, I think like, you know, UFO 
culture, like a part of me, like I love stories, even though I'm not religious, I do love stories of religion if I don't feel like they are being preachy like yeah you know if it's like, not like god is not dead or whatever <laughs> well as long as it's not like trying to preach to me directly like, like even mm-hmm. the setup change your ways jam <laughs> kevin That's sorbo really just looking for, at you well, it's, <laughs> yeah, yeah, speaking of kevin sorbo that i was gonna just say like the the kind of setup of this movie i feel like has been really uh, adopted by like christian film yeah like Though the he, exorcist he, did it first the exorcist did it mm. too but it was it was like the guy's mom or something but mm. the similar kind of thing like like the kevin sorbo movie that movie the shack that came out it's always like the guy's got a dead kid or a dead wife and dead wife syndrome and, and he's become an atheist and <laughs> it's weird that they named a very religious movie the shack because that's like a horror movie title like a porn movie like it just feels <laughs> like it's not a religious movie title. Oh, that is the least of that movie's problems by the way <laughs> yeah uh no so i don't know like i I didn't feel like it was always that preaching. I do like movies that are kind of, you know, the play with the mythology of religion or, or, you know, the message of religion, even though I'm not necessarily religious. Mm-hmm. So I didn't, but even like the ending where he's like, I would have liked the ambiguous ending where we don't, totally know where yeah. we're left with this character spirituality. Yeah. You know end, he's going to find his faith at the end. They always do. Yeah, but literally like, the last, I don't believe it still. The last shot of the movie is him trying on his priest outfit. Yeah. Uh, yeah. That was just a little, little And then much. going, yay church! <laughs> running up the door. <laughs> Would you like to learn more about yeah. your local church? <laughs> you go to www.god.com <laughs> Oh, God has a website now? <laughs> yeah, yeah. So yeah. And I, Instagram. I'd say mildly rewatchable. I still think it's it's got enough Really good scenes housed inside of a movie that's off and on for me. Right. What about you, Blaine? I I love this movie. I really think it's a great movie. I think the direction is amazing, not of the actors, but of the camera. Tak Fujimoto was the DOP, and he's amazing in this movie. And and I think the the acting is is wooden, but it's not as wooden as like all his other movies uh, from here on out. Where like the Airbender was just just. Cardboard cutouts, people mouthing words. Yeah, when they ran out of planks of wood to barricade the house, they should have been like, can we use the wooden acting and somehow nail that to the door? <laughs> right, right. <laughs> yeah. um, but I love the story. I think I think it really does come together in the end, and I think people were disappointed because it wasn't quite a twist, and it wasn't, but it was also too heavy-handed to be, like, not a twist. So it, he just kind of fell in this weird area. Which I forgive him for, and and uh, you and love him. I do. I really like him. <laughs> I, you know, I like him. Um, what about you, Ryan? Uh, yeah, I, I'm. St- I, I would have to agree. I, I I definitely think it's rewatchable. I love the score. There's some wonderful vignettes, like you said, the leg leaving the cornfield and the the fingers under the. I, I think there's some amazing images in this movie. Now, in terms of like the overall message, uh, I do struggle with that, and I struggle all the time with just this whole UFO thing. You know what I what I believe versus what the hundreds of people are telling me on a day to day basis that they're seeing. Um, so I think this was the movie where M night really started to, uh, try something new. Um, but at the same time, I struggle with that third act where it's all kind of spoon fed to us. Um, I don't know. I don't know if, if I like the message the movie was trying to convey, but I certainly liked the whole alien aspect. So Yeah. It's rewatchable. <laughs> rewatchable. <laughs> awesome. Well, thanks, Ryan, so much for coming on the show. Yeah, thanks, Ryan. Thank you again, guys. I mean, I've been listening forever, and it was an honor to finally come on. And, of course, it would be an alien movie. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah but we did uh, Fire in the Sky. And we, uh, oh, yeah. I would have loved to have done that. I, I've met Travis Walton on several occasions, and I'll tell you right cool. now, if there's any alien abduction case, I genuinely believe – that would be the one, and I, I would stake my "quote unquote" UFO career on that. Oh, well, amazing. the movie's convincing. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so, thank you very much for coming on. Where can they find your podcast? All my episodes, um, bonus material, all that can be found at somewhereintheskies.com. dot com. Okay, great. Thanks so much. And you can find us at rewatchability.com. You can go on iTunes and subscribe and rate us out of five stars. You can go to patreon.com slash rewatchability if you want to throw us a bone. And you can go to Facebook and Twitter to talk to us. Yeah, I just want to clarify, we don't want actual bones. No. No? No? (laughs) Okay. (laughs) That would have worked if this was a dog movie. (laughs) (laughs)
Somewhere in the Skies is produced by Third Kind Productions in association with the Entertainment One Podcast Network. To learn more, visit entertainmentonepodcast.com.